welcome to our last but not least lecture on phylum chordata. So phylum chordata has over 52,000 species in it. However, only 2,000 of those are invertebrates. The rest of those are actually vertebrates. But whether they are invertebrates or vertebrates, all chordates have the following features at some point during their life. All right, the first is a notochord. This notochord is kind of like a flexible support rod. The second is a dorsal nerve cord that is also hollow. Um, you have this, believe it or not, your nerve cord, your spinal cord is actually hollow on the inside. Okay. The second is pharyngeal, or I'm sorry, the third is pharyngeal slits or clefts, sometimes called gill slits. And the fourth is a muscular post-anal tail. Now, some chordates have all of these throughout their whole life, like this lancet that's in this picture here. However, not every chordate does. You might be thinking, well, I'm a human and I don't have a post-anal tail and I don't have gill slits, but at one point you did. So even for a, a human embryo, at one point they had a dorsal hollow nerve cord. They had pharyngeal pouches. These different pouches actually become different parts of your jaw and your ears. Um, we also had a notochord as an embryo and a post-anal tail. So you did have all of those chordate characteristics as an embryo, but you don't necessarily have them as an adult. And that's true for many of our chordates. They, chordates. they may have these characteristics as a juvenile, but not as an adult. So let's take a look at their bodies. For symmetry, chordates do have bilateral symmetry. All right, their skeleton, most of them have an endoskeleton, though this may vary. Um, some of them have just a hydrostatic skeleton. Um, a digestive system, they have one, and it is complete, again, for most of them. Um, their circulatory system really varies, especially based on where they live, whether they live on land or in the water, how large they are as to what kind of circulatory system they have. Their segmentation, they are segmented, but that segmentation is typically internal, not external, and may be lost um, as an adult. And then for their nervous system, they do have a brain, usually, um, and some kind of dorsal nerve cord. That one, at least, we know they all have as chordates, is that dorsal nerve cord. So what does an invertebrate chordate look like? One example is this lancet right here. The one that we are actually more familiar with in ocean terms is subphylum urochordata. We typically know these as sea squirts or tunicates. Sometimes they can be called salps, and they are um, planktonic. They live in great big chains like this. Either way, the basic body form for a sea squirt, it kind of looks like a mitten. All right, so it looks like this. It's got um, something called a basket inside, which literally looks like a basket. Okay, water comes in one end and out the other. They use the basket to catch their food. So these sea squirts or tunicates are typically sessile and they're filter feeders. And believe it or not, this thing that looks like a hollow mitten is actually among all the invertebrates that we've seen is our closest relative. Among the inverts that we've seen in this series of lectures. Okay. So that's one sub subphylum. Another subphylum in our chordates is subphylum vertebrata, which unsurprisingly is our vertebrates. And this includes things like humans, mammals, and fish, things with a backbone. Now it's this inclusion of vertebrates that makes classifying invertebrates a little bit tricky. We might like to say, oh, I really wish, can we just call invertebrates a phylum and everything underneath it? And that would be great, except if we put our chordates on our tree, our vertebrates would actually be a branch of our chordates, okay? 
And we can't have a grouping like this that doesn't include one of the tips. That's called a paraphyletic grouping when you have, um, when you're trying to classify things and you leave off one of the ends of the branches in the evolutionary tree. And that just doesn't work. So we can't do that. And th so that's why we don't have a classification for invertebrates. It's just a kind of a label we stick on animals that don't have a backbone. All right, so now we have made it to the end of our invertebrate biology lecture. Go ahead and complete the Stream Biodiversity Virtual Lab if that was assigned to you, and I hope you learned a whole lot about invertebrates in this series.